Welcome to episode 59 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad, it represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL, and this episode is Liberty Dad Talks Taxes at a Town Hall, where I'll discuss a real-life experience where my words in the present provided an opportunity for a future conversation. So, let's dive right in. If you're familiar with this show, and me in general, you already know that I put a high value on communication. So high that for me, it frequently ranks higher than an idea itself. It's not that I'm neutral or even open to just any idea. It's because when someone uses good communication to engage me with an idea that I think is terrible or one I feel has many problems, a few things happen. First, I find myself being less prone to reacting emotionally. Terrible ideas already tend to provoke or evoke strong emotions. There's no reason the delivery should as well. Number two, good communication from the other person includes listening to what I have to say. That means my challenges, disagreement, and concerns are actually heard. And then finally, if I happen to be wrong about an idea, good communication will pave the way for me to reconsider. Sometimes that happens immediately, but usually it's later over time. And the same happens when I use good communication. The person I'm talking to is less prone to react emotionally. I actually listen to what they have to say, meaning they feel heard. And if they happen to be wrong on an issue, then my good communication will pave the way for them to reconsider. Another reason for good communication is that it provides an opportunity to shift a negative perception to a positive or neutral one, or at least reduce the degree of the negative perception. Now, let's put all of that into a real-life experience that I had just last night. Here is what happened. I attended a local town hall regarding a potential gas tax increase here in my county to fund some major infrastructure projects. Our county currently has a $0.06 tax that was implemented back in 2016 and set to expire in 2036. The city council is seeking to extend that by 10 years and add another six or six cent tax for 30 years. By Florida's local uh, Florida statute, local communities are limited on what sorts of taxes they may levy, and gas taxes are only permitted to be used for transportation and infrastructure. I briefed myself fairly well before attending, then when I got there, I filled out the speaker card. Our city council, the uh, the meetings or any town halls that they do, this was actually a town hall, they permit citizens to speak for three minutes. More on that in just a moment. As an active member of Toastmasters, an organization that helps build skills in leadership and public speaking, I have developed three primary goals whenever I speak publicly. Number one, I want to speak intelligently. If I say something is a fact, I work diligently to know for sure that it is. Number two, I challenge myself in some way when I'm speaking. Maybe I attempt a new speaking technique or touch upon some sensitive topics or what have you. The third one, I like to plant ideas into people's minds. Now that last one, it might sound a little bit sinister, but it really isn't. It's simply me leaving someone with something to think about, because I know that people are often convinced over time, not immediately in the present. Therefore, give people something meaningful to chew on. Now back to that town hall. The matter at hand is a gas tax increase. 
I am about to present myself as the chair of the local Libertarian Party. And one favorite slogan that Libertarians love to say, you guessed it, taxation is theft. Now, usually, I don't like the slogan because I've watched I, too often I've watched people say it without any meaningful follow-up. It's not that it's bad, nor that it's incorrect. It's how it's been delivered. Yes. We have a studio and guest to, or a studio uh, guest in the studio today. Hey, he's left now, so yes. Okay. All right, you're making this quite a show, bud. Yeah, I'm recording. Okay. All right. So where were we? Uh, we were talking about the slogan, taxation is theft. And it's not that it's a bad slogan, again, like I was saying, or that it's incorrect. It's often just a matter of how that it's being delivered. I decided to challenge myself to include it somehow without sounding like a crazy person. I wanted to include it in such a way that it might actually diminish any negative connotation that others already have from hearing it elsewhere or even uh, or even better prime people who maybe have not really heard it much so that when they hear it in the future they don't recoil i wanted to include the video of me speaking but it wasn't posted on the city's website at the time of this recording luckily i wrote my words down prior to speaking I'll repeat what I said at the city council meeting, and then I want to go over what I think that I've accomplished, or at least the reason for why I did what I did, why I said what I said. Then I'm going to tell you what happened after the meeting. So let's get into that. Here's what I said. My name is D.L. Cummings. I live in such and such area and in such and such neighborhood. I am the chair of the Libertarian Party here in Duval County. Anyone who knows anything about libertarians knows we are highly averse to taxes. All of them. Many may have heard the common phrase, taxation is theft. But rather than talk with slogans, I'd like to ask a serious question for my fellow citizens to consider and proponents to answer. We currently have a six cents tax that is being asked to add an additional 10 years and then add an additional six cent tax for 30 years. Fuel efficiency advancements seem to already outpace the ability for taxes to fund infrastructure. Here's my question. What evidence do you have that fuel efficiency advancements and the demand for electric and hybrid vehicles will not place a future Jacksonville in the position to need additional taxes to complete these infrastructure projects? Okay, so that's what I said. If you're keeping track, you'll remember that I said I had three minutes to speak. And when I spoke, I went off script slightly, but I only spent about a minute speaking. That means I left two minutes on the table. And you know what? That's okay. Sometimes it's preferable. Rarely does anyone complain when you make your point in the least amount of time. Often, they appreciate it. And when you do, your words tend to not have unnecessary information that just distracts from the core message that you're trying to communicate. And now, if you're planning ahead, plan to speak at about 150 words per minute. After you practice a few times, you'll get a feel for your speed, and you can adjust appropriately when given a time limit. But I digress. Let's review, a, let's get into a breakdown of what I intended to accomplish with my words. Since I am the chair of the local party, the county party, I believe that I'm always representing that position when I'm speaking publicly on such matters. I introduced myself as such. Since the topic was taxes and libertarians tend towards strong feelings about them, I included a lighthearted reference to our position. And then I took the phrase, taxation is theft, and verbally placed it to the side by calling it a slogan saying that I wanted to ask a serious question. Now, it might sound like I'm diminishing the phrase, but I don't think so. Short phrases like that today are often seen as bumper sticker level comments and rarely useful without some accompanied explanation. Of course, I didn't have time for an explanation, and instead, I placed it next to a serious question that I felt would offset how people might feel about the slogan. 
a question I felt was very relevant, I felt was intelligent, and would cause people to really think about the current issue at hand, increasing the gas tax. Yes, you know people are watching, right, bud? Yeah? Okay. You know people are watching? Okay. <laughs> all right. So my goal wasn't to defend all taxation being theft. We weren't talking about taxes in general. My goal was to put doubt that this tax would do what it said it would do, which was fund a plethora of infrastructure projects. By juxtaposing the two, taxation is theft and a serious question, I believe that I subtly challenged any notion that libertarians are just opposed to taxes, you know, to be opposed. I believe that you sound more credible when following up potentially crazy idea or what someone else might think is crazy with something that makes people think. The next thing I did was I put the issue into the briefest form that I could by stating the current tax and duration and the tax they wanted to add. No charged language, no insulting adjectives, just an unbiased as possible overview. I didn't want to give people a reason to argue and miss my real point. Imagine I had said something like, and you're asking to add a tax that steals from my son, the one that keeps coming in here while I'm trying to record. Everyone would focus their attention on the issue of stealing in children, and they'd begin to think of counter-arguments before I even got to my point. Then I ask my question. It's not a gotcha question, but it's one that asks the people listening to really evaluate the real-world impact of this tax. I also use the word evidence very deliberately. I could have asked something like, do you believe, and followed it up with a question, but that practically hands them an easy answer of, well, yes, I do. I believe that we can maintain the necessary revenue stream in light of the concern that you bring up. So the question is, how do you challenge that? Well, you can't. So instead, I asked for evidence. By the way, they didn't provide any. In about 150 words and one minute of everyone's time, I think I accomplished a great deal. I presented a reasonable and strong question and juxtaposed that against what many might regard as a silly phrase with the hope of leaving the audience feeling good about my overall concern, even if they ultimately disagreed. My goal was to set the stage for a later conversation while challenging the current issue of the increased gas tax. Whether I accomplished that, uh, whether I accomplished the latter in the minds of the supporters is hard to say, but I did set the stage for a future conversation. After the meeting, as I was leaving, two women approached, one wearing a mask and one not. The one without a mask inquired where in the neighborhood I mentioned I lived. I told her, and then, uh-oh, looks like my guest is coming back in. Yes? Okay, I need a blanket? Okay. Folks, apparently I need a blanket. Yes? Okay. All right. Let me get back to recording, buddy, then we'll go play. Okay, awesome. All right. I appreciate your patience, folks. Tough world sometimes when you got a little one like this. So anyway, where were we? So um, the woman that, uh, uh, so two women had approached me. And so two women had approached me and I told them where I lived. And one of the women, she turned out to be the ex-wife of the man who sold us the house. That was the one that was wearing the mask. So I didn't recognize her. Small world, right? The other woman is a current neighbor who I just wasn't very familiar with. I was asked, again, what group I was with. I told her I was with the chair of the local Libertarian affiliate and that the Libertarian Party was the third largest political party in the nation found in all 50 states. Yes. Shh, 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 shh. She then inquired about our position on taxes. So I briefly described two major camps, those who oppose all government, that is, no taxes, and those who are willing to accept very minimal government limited taxes, me being the latter. I told her the reason we say it's theft is because taxes are always taken by force from someone. Using the three of us as an example, 
I said that if two of us had agreed to a tax increase, but the third did not, she would still be forced to give up some of her money. I then said that unless every single person agreed to a tax increase, someone would always be forced to give up their money. And then I described force as basically money taken that if they refused would be met with other forceful measures, such as being fined, arrested, so on and so forth. That then led to questions about how we might come up with the money for the projects. Now, unfortunately, there were quite a few projects requiring upwards of a billion dollars in funding over time. And because I spent the majority of my time reading the actual bill, I was not as familiar with the actual projects. But that's okay. I was honest, and I told her that I did not have an answer. But I did follow up with pointing out that I would first need to determine the scope of the projects that I had agreed that I agreed with, if, um, and then if I only felt like, say, half of those projects were worthy of the conversation, then we would only need about half the money, of course, assuming here that it's evenly spread out over all of the projects. That all happened in under, I don't know, about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Now, I like to think about this and say, had I presented differently, I could only guess whether such an opportunity would have arisen. I believe that my cordial nature, willingness to tackle radical concepts while considering my audience, that was the key, provided me the opportunity to speak more later. Remember, it was the two women that approached me after the meeting, and all I did was answer what was asked of me. This is the essence of Liberty Dad. It's not straying away from radical ideas, but straying away from radical language that makes it harder for people to be curious about them. The more radical an idea is with your audience, the more you might put into delivering it. You may withhold some ideas out of, not out of fear, but as a courtesy to them so that you don't overwhelm them. I could have used all three minutes to talk about how taxation was theft, how no one else had the right to vote on taking my money away. But while it's all true, the question I have to ask is, am I setting myself up for a future conversation and am I leaving those who are present and listening with something to really consider? I hope you enjoyed that segment. And now, as you know, it's time for a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. The goal of the Bill Review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I'm not a lawyer, this is not a legal interpretation, and I may be wildly wrong. Bills range from a page or two to many thousands of pages long. Since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. In this episode, I'm reviewing legislative document 1559 out of the state of Maine, titled as Commission to Develop a Paid Family and Medical Leave Benefits Program. This bill is only four pages, so it's not terribly long. Let's go ahead and dive right in on page two, lines three through five. Here's what it says. Whereas this resolve establishes the commission to develop a paid family and medical leave benefits program to study and develop a plan to implement a paid family and medical leave benefits program. Okay, it was a bit of a mouthful, but it seems pretty clear. This legislation will establish a commission to develop a paid family and medical leave program, or what we might call a PFML. The next two whereas clauses are where this legislation gets a little bit interesting. Continuing on in line 6 through 12, it says this, Whereas the study must be initiated before the 90-day period expires in order that the study may be completed and a report submitted in time for submission to the next legislative session. And, whereas, in the judgment of the legislature, these facts create an emergency within the meaning of the Constitution of Maine and require the following legislation as 
immediately necessary for the preservation of the public peace, health, and safety. Okay, before I get into that, I want to jump down to page 3, section 5, under duties. And in point number 1, it gives us some of the specifics of what this commission should do, saying this. Study the paid family and medical leave benefits programs in other states, including those that have established paid family and medical leave benefits programs. In its review of paid family and medical leave benefits programs in other states, the commission shall consider without limitation the following factors for each program. And then it goes on to list some of the specific criteria to consider while it's conducting the study. When we move on to point three, it continues listing the duties saying, quote, develop a plan to implement a paid family and medical leave benefits program by consulting with other states that have established paid family and medical leave benefits programs. Okay, here's what's happening. This bill creates an emergency based on timing with the legislative session and then initiates a study of other states under two assumptions. One, that a PFML is necessary or potentially beneficial in Maine. And then two, that PFMLs in other states have provided benefits to the citizens of those states. Here's the problem. Until a study of other states is conducted, any value or lack thereof cannot be known. And this bill, it makes no reference to any data or study suggesting that a PFML would even be beneficial for citizens in the state of Maine. Now, I'm not just making this up, okay? It says it in the bill. Here's what it says. Same page, section four of duties, contract four and complete an actuarial study of the planned program under subsection three, including startup cost and ongoing cost of the impact and benefits to the state and the contributions needed to maintain the solvency of the program. This legislation has declared itself an emergency to keep the peace and then creates a commission to develop a plan to implement a PFML before actually studying the impact that PFMLs had in other states or before determining any necessity within the state of Maine or any economic benefits and the needs uh, and what would be necessary to keep it solvent. In other words, it has no data whatsoever, but it, but it simultaneously says to go and study for the data and then create a report, assuming that the data is going to come back and tell them that a PFML is necessary. Okay, finally, on the last page, this is what we see. This bill, it designates $200,000, again, to develop a plan that has no data to support that it is necessary or even fiscally solvent. Voters of Maine, if you're watching, you would do well to make emergency calls to your representatives using your angry inside voice and tell them to reject this bill. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head on over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 8 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. While you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.